Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for joining us in what's in the final session of our social housing webinar series for the first half of the year. And today's session is in relation to mold and damp and some considerations for landlords. So the speakers that we have today, um, my name is Fiona McLeod. I am a legal director and a solicitor advocate. I sit within our government regulation and competition team and have a particular expertise um, working within social housing and governance and litigation. I'm joined um, this afternoon by my colleagues, Laura McMillan and Kate Donaghy. Laura is a partner and the director of advocacy in Brodie's um, and Kate is a managing associate, both um, of um, Laura and Kate work within our um, insurance team and also have particular expertise working with social housing clients and are best place to talk to you um, about what happens when you have any particular claims or what you should or shouldn't be doing if mold and damp arises within your properties. So given there's quite a lot in this topic, we'll just kick on um, and I'm going to talk a little bit around um, the background um, to mold and damp, what landlord's duties are in relation to particularly with a view to the tolerable standard, the Scottish housing quality standard um, and compliance with the um, Scottish housing regulators charter um, and your tenancy agreements with um, your tenants. Um, Laura is then going to come on to talk about landlord's health and safety duties and Kate is going to talk then finally about landlord's obligations in terms of the Occupiers Liability Scotland Act and consequences of a breach of duty. So probably first and foremost to talk about um, is how really mould and damp has been an issue um, for social housing providers for some time, but of late it has come to the forefront of both the political and media spectrums. And the reason for that is um, tragically around the death of two year old um, in 2020, and he died as a result of a severe respiratory condition due to prolonged exposure to mould in his home. Um, the child lived in a housing association home in England, and the quote here is from the coroner that was investing the case, and they were reported to say that the tragic death of Awab will and should be a defining moment for the housing sector in terms of increasing knowledge, increasing awareness and deepening an understanding surrounding the issue of damp and mould. Now, although this incident occurred in England, and there is a very different regulatory framework for Scotland, um, social housing providers, um, this child's death is a stark reminder of the harmful impacts of damp and mould and the need for social landlords, both councils and housing associations, and equally private landlords throughout the UK to tackle the problem. So if we could just move on to the next slide, please. So, well, what is the issue? So I thought just have a little bit of background of where we're at and, and what we're dealing with in the sector at the moment. Um, so well, what's the scale of dampness? within Scotland's homes and the latest Scottish housing condition survey was published in 2019 and what that said was effectively it estimated that relatively few of Scotland's homes suffered from dampness and condensation and 91% of all homes in all 10 years so that social private rented owner occupied were free from damp or condensation and that rate's been pretty stable um, over recent years, but it represents an overall improvement trajectory um, since 2012. There was a recent um, portfolio question time and at that the Cabinet Secretary for Social Housing, Justice and Local Government said that the survey showed that 99% of social homes were free from damp and 86 were free from any sign of mould. However, as you will all be aware, for those that are working within um, the social housing sector, there have been an increased numbers of notifications and claims in respect of mould and damp in the property. Um, and really, this all comes on the back of significant media interest around the child's death in England and also um, in relation to the increased political interest. And that was followed um, in on the 19th of November 2022, when the Secretary of State for Leveling Up Housing and Communities issued a letter to all providers of social housing, calling for social landlords to take responsibility for their stock and assess any issues of mould and damp in properties, and most importantly, to take action that might be necessary. And following that letter, um, on the 19th of February, on the 1st of December 2022, um, the Scottish Housing Regulator issued a letter to landlords with advice on tenant safety, damp and mould 
and produced a briefing note in conjunction with the Chartered Institute of Housing, the Scottish Federation of Housing Associations and a Lacho on damp and mould for social housing providers. And that's a really useful briefing note for those that have not yet had the opportunity to review that. So fast forward from December last year and into May of this year, and the Local Government Housing and Planning Committee met to take evidence from two separate panels of witnesses on damp and mould in social and private rented housing. And the main purpose of the session was to try and understand the extent of the problem in the rental sector in Scotland. And that was, um, as I mentioned, for both social and private rented. And it was really to ask whether the regulatory framework provides sufficient protections to tenants as it currently stands. Um, the evidence sessions are available on parliament.scot and it's really useful um, to watch through and hear what a number of organisations in the sector um, view it are in relation to um, mould and damp within housing. So if we move on to the next slide, please. Um, so what are social landlords' responsibilities to deal with damp homes? Well, in accordance with the Housing Scotland Act 2001, uh, social landlords have a legal duty to ensure that properties that they let are wind and watertight and in all other respects reasonably fit for human habitation. In addition, Scottish land, social landlords sorry, must ensure that properties they let meet the Scottish Housing Quality Standards, so the SHQS. Um, and one aspect of the SHQS is that homes must be substantially free from rising and penetrating damp. And I'll come on to a little bit more about the SHQS and the tolerable standard in a moment. Um, all residential dwellings in Scotland, including social and private rented homes and um, owner occupied homes, they must comply with the tolerable standard. And the tolerable standard is a minimum standard which is defined within the Housing Scotland Act 1987. And local authorities can take certain actions, including demolition of properties where a house does not meet that standard. And well, what does the tolerable standard say? Well, the tolerable standard lists criteria that a dwelling house must satisfy. And that includes, among other things, must be substantially free from rising and penetrating damp. So social landlords have to ensure that the properties that they're letting are meeting the tolerable standard. And in turn, if they meet the tolerable standard, they will meet the Scottish housing quality standard. Now, there are a number of difficulties um, that are placed um, on the sector at the moment and there's a number of competing pressures because social landlords are also trying to improve the energy efficiency of their homes and there are plans set for a new housing standard in the housing to 2040 um, agenda but in general terms um, what should social landlords be doing at the moment well you're responsible for major repairs to the structure installation of a property residents are responsible for minor interior repairs and decorations but social landlords must have their own policies for carrying out repairs in accordance with the legislative and policy framework and also to ensure compliance with the regulatory framework, which I'll, I'll come on to on the next slide. So not to cut across what um, Laura and Kate are saying, but what should a resident do if they're not satisfied with the social landlord response to complaints about dampness in their homes? Well, sometimes it's really quite difficult. Um, to identify the problems that are causing dampness and rectifying them can take some time. But what has become clear um, over the recent publications that have been produced by a number of organisations within the sector is that um, the, really the blame should not be placed um, on the tenant's lifestyle, which I think had been done previously. And it's really important that if a resident's living in a damp property and thinks that they're not taking appropriate action to deal with the problem, then they consider a, v a formal complaint via the social landlord's um, formal complaint process, or alternatively, they can make a complaint to the Scottish Public Sector Ombudsman. If they make a complaint to the SPSO, then the Ombudsman would consider, for example, whether or not the landlord followed their complaints procedures and whether the actions are reasonable. And they will report on those cases um, and make recommendations to address um, final loss or cost. And I think it's really worthwhile um, for those of you that haven't watched the parliamentary evidence sessions to hear what the Ombudsman is saying in respect of what work they are doing in this particular sector. What residents can also do is they can also take a case to the Sheriff Court um, and they can ask the court um, to force the landlord to fix the repairs within a certain amount of time. And if they don't comply, then the court may order that compensation um, is payable. So if we could just move to the next slide, please, Aisling. Well, 
what are the regulatory requirements and all of this? What do you have to do as a social housing provider to make sure that you're complying with the current regulatory regime um, in addition to the legislative provisions? Well, as you all know, um, the regulator for social housing is the Scottish Housing Regulator and the SHR role is really to monitor and report on performance of social landlords. That includes compliance with requirements that social landlords should aim to comply with the standards and meet the outcomes that are set in the Scottish Social Housing Charter and the Social Housing Quality Standards. The Charter sets out the outcomes which are defined as either a standard or an objective which the social landlord should aim to achieve. And I think it's important to note the wording is that you're to aim to achieve these standards. And one of those standards includes the condition and quality of housing accommodation and the maintenance and repair of housing accommodation. And in particular, Charter Outcome 4 provides that houses are to meet the Scottish Housing Quality Standard. As I mentioned, a house fails to meet the Scottish Housing Quality Standard if it fails to meet the tolerable standard. So if the house is substantially free from rising or penetrating damp, it meets the tolerable standard and therefore will meet that particular part of the Scottish Housing Quality Standard. So what can the SHR do if there is a failure um, to um, comply with the standards and also if there is um, a failure for the house to be substantially free from rising or penetrating damp? Well, the SHR's powers are, of intervention are prescribed by the Housing Scotland Act 2010. Um, the SHR cannot require that individual houses are brought up to standard, closed or demolished. That's a power that the local authority has. Um, the SHR can, however, take regulatory action if there are systemic issues um, of mould and damp in stock and a failure to, com failure to repair such uh, systemic issues um, and ensure compliance with the Charter. And currently, what the SHR do is they ask their social landlords to provide details in their annual assurance statements regarding tenant safety. And this includes where instances of damp and mould have been identified. Moving forward, the SHR is considering whether it will introduce additional indicators to monitor and assess damp and mould in social housing. This is at the very early stages of consideration and it will consult with the sector prior to making a final decision in this regard. But it's important to know where the direction of travel is going. And I think Laura and Kate are going to touch a little bit more on um, the particular um, risks that are involved um, for social housing providers and, and how to mitigate those risks. So I'll pa now pass over to Laura. Thank you very much, Fiona, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so the, the focus on dampness and mould in tenanted properties does, of course, mean it's also a focus for regulators in this sector, and in particular, those regulators who have enforcement powers in relation to health and safety matters. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about um, for the next uh, 10 minutes or so. There are two key, key pieces of legislation in this context that are useful to look at. Um, the first is on the screen there, which is the Health and Safety at Work Act. Now, the Health and Safety at Work Act is often overlooked when it comes to domestic premises as they are not obviously a place of work but the provision of rented accommodation as part of a company or an organisation's undertaking is undoubtedly caught by the terms of the 1974 Act. And the key obligation in the 1974 Act in relation to non-employees, um, that is in this context tenants and others who may be in the rented properties, is section 3.1. And you'll see it says there, it shall be the duty of every employer to conduct his undertaking in such a way as to ensure, so far as reasonably practicable, that persons not in his employment who may be affected thereby are not thereby exposed to risks to their health and safety. And if you breach this section of the Act, it is a criminal offence, and I'll come back to um, the sanctions for a breach a bit later on. And if we move on to the next slide, the second piece of legislation that I just wanted to, to look at um, briefly is the Housing Scotland Act 2001, which Fiona has already mentioned and is no doubt familiar to you. Section 27 lays down the repairing obligation on landlords and Schedule 4 sets that obligation out in more detail. 
The salient parts of Schedule 4, this isn't the full thing, are set out on the, the slide, but the terms are the same, identical or similar, no doubt, to what is incorporated into um, any tenancy agreement um, that a landlord has um, in the social housing sector. The obligation on the landlord to make sure that a property is fit for human habitation at the date of entry is an absolute one. And I, I just wanted to spend a little bit of time on what that actually means, because it's different from the continuing obligation to repair the property after the date of entry, which requires a landlord only to do what is, is reasonable. And, and Kate will talk a bit more about that. But what the absolute obligation means is that there is no basis for a landlord to say that the issue which rendered the property unfit for human habitation at the date of entry would not or could not have been identified at a pre-late inspection. So just to explain that a bit uh, more, the property is or is not fit for human habitation at the date of entry. And it's irrelevant whether the landlord should or could have known, for example, that there was damp or mould in the property. So while the ab obligation in relation to um, the state of the property at date of entry is an absolute one under the Act, the definition of what fit for human habitation means isn't always straightforward. And if we look at the other excerpts of Schedule 4 here, you'll see that in considering whether a property is fit for human habitation, regard is to be, has, is to be had to the extent of any sanitary defects, and helpfully sanitary defects expressly includes dampness. The legislation doesn't say that any property which has dampness at the date of entry, or indeed after that, is automatically unfit for human habitation, there will still need to be an assessment of the extent of any dampness and or mould to, to determine whether or not it's unfit for human habitation. And it's obviously a different term from um, meeting tolerable standard, but I think that when a, if a court was being asked to look at the definition of fitness for human habitation, if it had been established that the property had not met tolerable tolerable standard, then that may go some way, if not the full way, to establishing that it was also unfit for human habitation. Um, so just coming back to my, my point about the, the sort of distinction between the uh, obligation, the absolute obligation at date of entry and the, the obligation just to act reasonably thereafter. If the extent of the dampness and mould is such that the property is unfit for human habitation and it can be proved that it was in that state of, at the date of entry, it's no defence for a landlord to an alleged breach of the Housing Scotland Act or indeed, and, and perhaps more relevantly, the tenancy agreement to say that the landlord could not have reasonably known about it. So from a... Um, a health and safety perspective, what if a landlord breaches this term of the 2001 Act? Well, a breach of the 2001 Act would be relevant to any enforcement action taken by a regulator, which I'm going to come on to, but the Act doesn't, on the face of it, give rise to a private right of action. That is, on the face of it, a tenant couldn't sue a landlord directly for compensation arising from a breach of the act and, and no other individual could, could do so either. Um, and I, I, I said there twice on the face of it, and I say that because we actually are dealing at the moment with a group action against um, an RSL where the claimants are saying that compensation is due to them for injuries that they have developed as a result directly of a breach of the Act. And we'll need to wait to see whether they're right. It's not something that's been looked at by the courts before. But regardless, if they are right, um, and I'm wrong, um, then it, it, it doesn't matter really because the tenant, at the very least, does still have a remedy 
because the tenancy agreement itself should contain repairing obligations in line with the 2001 Act. So normally a claim by an individual tenant will be brought on the basis of breach of contract. And um, that is, they will say, well, I have been injured, you have breached your repairing obligations, um, my health and safety has been affected because of this breach under the tenancy agreement, um, and so I'm going to bring a claim um, against you for that breach, and they're fully entitled to do that. And again, Kate's going to expand on that a bit more as well as in relation to occupiers' liability uh, for landlords generally. And if we move on to the next slide, um, aside from a compensation claim, uh, what are the other potential consequences where dampness and mould has been found in one or, or more than one property and the landlord has or appears to have breached its health and safety obligations as a result of that? Well, the, the quick answer, simple answer is that the regulators can take action. And the three main regulators of relevance in a health and safety context are the Scottish Housing Regulator, local authorities and the Health and Safety Executive. Now, their powers are not identical, but when it comes to social housing, there's considerable overlap. And so it's not possible to say definitively which regulator will deal if an incident arises that warrants regulatory investigation. And frankly, often it will come down to, to resourcing. Um, as well. So what I've done here is I've listed the main powers which the various regulators have and, and you can see that they extend beyond action in relation to resolving the specific issue such as an improvement notice to repair a property that's got damp or mould. Um, they range from that to in the most serious of cases potentially altering the management structure of an RSL or even moving its assets. And then there's also potential for prosecution. Now, I mentioned earlier that breach of Section 3 of the Health and Safety Work Act is a criminal offence. And it's also possible that other health and safety legislation could be breached um, in an incident or instance involving damp and mould. Um, and again, that would be a criminal offence. It's worth bearing in mind that if the health and safety executive um, is the ultimate investigating authority, they can charge a fee for their investigation. And the early rate is for that fee um, is currently £166. And the cost of an investigation can run into thousands of pounds uh, or tens of thousands of pounds. So it's not insignificant sums and it's highly unlikely that you would have any insurance um, to cover that. And then for the HSC, all they need to do is to identify that they think there has been a material breach. They don't of the legislation. They don't actually have to, to prove that there has been a material breach in order to investigate and to recover a fee for intervention. And where a prosecution is successful, the organisation can be fined. And again, that's not going to be insured. That would come out of the organisation's pocket. And in the most serious cases, it may be that an individual or individuals in the organisation could be prosecuted separately and potentially imprisoned. All sounds very scary. I have to mention it because it's possible, but it is highly unlikely. Um, ordinarily, when landlords are imprisoned for breach of health and safety duties, such as uh, you might have seen in the paper, the landlord that was sentenced in May um, for 13 months, he's, he's not the first, he won't be the last, um, for fire safety breaches, was operating effectively as a sole trader rather than part of a, an organisation. But it's possible, even if you are part of a, a company or an organisation, to be prosecuted as an individual, as well as or instead of the organisation. In most cases where there's potential for a prosecution, one of the key issues for the regulator or the Crown Office in considering whether or not to recommend or bring a prosecution um, is and also it's a key issue for the court when considering the level of any fine if there is a successful prosecution is whether or not there is a systemic issue within the organisation and that is was this just a case 
of the organisation dropping the ball? Was it a one-off or is there a systemic problem? And I think when it comes to something like what we're talking about today with damp and mould, that would be a real um, it would be a real key issue for the prosecutor, for the regulator, and thinking about is this just one property unfortunately missed? There were, you know, there were issues that did potentially lead to breach of the legislation, or can we actually show that this was a systemic problem across the properties and it's just lucky that there hasn't been um, an issue elsewhere? So the better systems that you have in place, the better your ability to prove that you have good systems in place through good record keeping. Um, and that all feeds back to what Fiona was talking about around about the advice in the recent um, briefing um, in, earlier this year. The more likely you will be to avoid regulatory involvement in the first place. And then if something does happen, you're going to be in a better position um, to defend yourself because you can actually show that you have been doing everything right. And with that, I am now going to hand over to Kate to talk about um, actions for damages. Yeah. So Laura has been speaking there about the duties and obligations owed um, by landlords in terms of the health and safety legislation and the Housing Act. I'm going to look now um, at potential liability in terms of the Occupiers Liability Scotland Act 1960. And this act effectively swept away previous Scottish case law in relation to an occupier's liability for loss or injury on its premises. And it sets out the duties owed by occupiers um, to visitors. If you breach this act, you aren't guilty of a criminal offence and you can't be prosecuted. But if someone's actually harmed or property is actually damaged, you could be sued um, for damages. So if you look at the next slide, um, is there a breach? A key distinction between this um, act and the health and safety duties Laura discussed, apart from the fact that you won't end up in prison if you breach it, um, is that something has to have actually gone wrong. Um, for a claim to arise, um, something someone must have actually been injured or their property actually damaged. A near miss wouldn't allow anyone to claim. Whereas with the health and safety legislation, a, a breach doesn't need to have actually led to any harm or loss um, for there to be an investigation or a prosecution. It's easier um, to prove that this act has been breached. It only needs to be on the balance of probabilities, not beyond reasonable doubt as it is with criminal cases. And in practice, this means that a claimant needs to show that their version of events is more likely than not to have been what happened. A 51% likelihood tips the balance in their favour. And the standard of care is lower than an occupier needs to show. You, you need to show reasonable care and to do what's reasonable to avoid loss or injury. And that can be compared with the standard of care in terms of the health and safety legislation, which is to do um, what's reasonably practicable um, to avoid harm. And in practice, that higher health and safety duty can come really quite close to doing anything, anything possible to avoid someone being injured. So it's not quite so onerous in terms of the Occupier's Liability Act. And there'll be more room for arguing that it wasn't reasonable uh, to do something. And in considering that, the behaviour of uh, other people in a similar position um, will be relevant. It's not decisive, but it can be weighed in the balance. And that's because it points to what's reasonable in the particular circumstances you're in. So, what are the potential consequences of breaching the Occupier's Liability Act? Well, as I've said, you could be sued uh, for damages uh, and as opposed to fines or fees for intervention in the health and safety context, uh, a claim like this and the damages um, that you're ordered to pay uh, are quite likely to be covered um, by insurance. Um, but the cost to your organisation doesn't stop there. It, there is, of course, publicity. So the fact that the organisation has been sued it will be public knowledge um, because the rules of court, which are a list of cases calling in, in a court, are published online by the Scottish Court Service. Um, and hearings, if they're in person, will generally be open to the public and the press. And obviously, uh, the negative publicity surrounding a claim like this um, could be quite considerable. Um, it might make it more expensive in the future to secure insurance, um, more expensive or more difficult um, to find policies. 
and there's a time and resource that it takes to investigate and defend these claims in terms of staff giving statements, um, looking out documents, attending meetings or, or ultimately giving evidence in court. And so uh, moving on to what does someone need to do uh, to have a successful claim? Well, as I've said, uh, there must be a loss. Um, Can we go to the next slide? Sorry, Ashley. <laughs> yep. So I think um, the first thing to say here is that the name of the act is maybe a bit misleading. You're perhaps thinking, but a landlord doesn't occupy a property. That's the whole point. They've handed it over to a tenant. But the act has specific provision in it uh, for landlords. And essentially, a landlord will be liable um, if someone's harmed by a defect or hazard um, which they've caused um, or it's come about um, because of something uh, they had a duty to do or remove and they haven't done it. Um, and here, an example would be a landlord who has responsibility for looking after the windows and someone falls out of a window because it hasn't been maintained and it's it's rotten. That would be the landlord's responsibility and it would be the landlord who could be sued there. You could contrast that with a situation where a tenant's left custard lying all over the floor and someone comes along and slips on it. That's something that the landlord can't control and something for which they don't have responsibility and it wouldn't be the landlord who would be liable to be sued in those circumstances. So when you're working out what the landlord does have control over, and what, what is their responsibility, you would look at the tenancy agreement and what the landlord's uh, obligations are in terms of that. Uh, and you would also look at the Scottish Housing Quality Standard, the Tolerable Standard, the Housing Scotland Act 2001 and the Private Tenancy Act 2016, because those are the sources of a landlord's obligations in terms of the maintenance and repair of the property uh, which is being let out. Uh, and in this context, I think it's important um, to refer to what is or isn't within the landlord's control in terms of damp uh, and really the issue of condensation, because I think Historically, there has been a, a tendency towards the view that it's the tenant's fault if the property suffers from damp and mould through condensation because it's the tenant who should be opening the windows or putting the heating on. And there was an English case in the 80s where a tenant failed in a claim uh, for that very reason. The mould was a result of condensation and the court found that was a tenant's fault and it wasn't for the landlord to sort that out for the tenant. Um, I'm aware from uh, the recent evidence sessions uh, Fiona mentioned in the Scottish uh, Parliament uh, and also the English Housing Ombudsman's uh, report and the briefing note issued um, by the Scottish Housing Organisations that this isn't a view uh, that's taken now and that a suggestion that something's happened because the tenant's done something wrong is likely to be viewed in quite a dim light and uh, as was mentioned um, in the Scottish briefing note the activities that tenants are being criticised for are things like boiling pasta or drying their clothes or, or taking showers and really it's quite unfair to suggest that those are unreasonable um, lifestyle choices which tenants should uh, should be avoiding. So I think in terms of where the landlord's responsibilities lie in terms of damp and mould in the last 10 to 20 years that's probably expanded uh, such that landlords have more responsibility than they might previously have been thought to have um, for that. Uh, the next thing that someone must prove um, to make a successful claim is the landlord's knowledge, so that the landlord knew uh, there was a problem. Now, a landlord's not assumed to know the condition of the property for the full course uh, of the tenancy. Uh, there's an obligation to hand the property over, as Laura's mentioned, uh, in, a, in a condition which doesn't give rise uh, to the risk of injury or damage. Uh, but thereafter, uh, the landlord's duty is really reactive and it's to react to reports from tenants that something's wrong. Um, if a landlord does an inspection then, and they find something, then they have a duty to rectify that because they do know that there's a problem. Um, I think this is another issue which really comes up in the, in the context of uh, damp and mould because a lot of the correspondence with the letter in 2020, December 22 from the Scottish Housing Regulator and, and the briefing note uh, refer to the need to be proactive and for social landlords to be really on top of the condition of their housing stock. Um, I don't think that changes the responsibilities in terms of the occupier's liability 
act and, and claims there. If your tenant doesn't tell you about something and you've got no other way of knowing about it, I think it would be difficult for them to bring a successful claim. But that said, I think the other thing that's that's really obvious from recent discussions on this issue is that the root causes of damp and mould should be looked at and landlords should be taking responsibility for structural or sort of inherent things in the property which give rise to the risk of these uh, issues coming to be. So ventilation, poor insulation leading to cold walls and the higher risk of condensation, if that's known about when the property is handed over or, or just known about generally because it's a feature of the housing stock, I think it might be more difficult for a landlord to argue that it didn't have knowledge uh, of these issues um, because it was foreseeable that they might arise. Uh, in terms of knowledge, it's also important that you make it possible for your tenants to tell you when there's a problem. So it, there needs to be a clear way of them communicating these issues and that that method of communication needs to be uh, made clear to them um, what it is and, and how they get in touch with you. I think if a tenant could demonstrate that there was an issue and they tried to tell the landlord but they couldn't because there wasn't a channel uh, through which to do that, I, I think that would make it easier for them to succeed in a claim. Uh, and so uh, moving on to what's reasonable uh, here. Uh, so in Occupiers Liability Act claim, it, the balance between the cost and benefit of something doesn't need to be as disproportionate as it is in a health and safety matter, where it really there would have to be an exceptionally low risk and an exceptionally high cost uh, before you could say it wasn't reasonably practicable to do something. Uh, in the context of occupiers' liability, if there was a, a low risk and, and a high cost, it might be possible to argue that it was disproportionate. And again, looking at what other landlords uh, in the same uh, area do, it will be relevant. Um, again, I think the focus on the issues of damp and mould, it means uh, that landlords should be aware, again, of the underlying causes of damp and mould and keeping properties in a good condition. And I think there's likely to be less tolerance from the courts for the argument that these are really difficult issues to resolve. I think that the, the message coming is that these are issues which should be tackled and that it is reasonable to expect landlords to tackle them. And finally, uh, I mentioned there needs to be a loss and the loss needs to be connected to the breach. So if you have breached your duties and someone has also become ill, uh, they, they might not necessarily succeed in a claim because they would need to show that that illness or injury was a result of uh, the landlord's breach of duty. In this kind of claim where we're looking at respiratory illnesses, uh, you're likely to need a medical opinion on that. Uh, it's worth bearing in mind though that the person making the claim only needs to show uh, that it's more likely than not that the illness they've suffered um, has uh, resulted uh, from the breach of duty. And so it's clear that the issue and for very understandable reasons is under the spotlight. Uh, and I think it's also clear that what is or isn't acceptable uh, for a reasonable landlord to do uh, has changed and, and is changing. Um, but there won't always be a claim in terms of the Occupiers Liability Act uh, just because there's a complaint. I think I'll now pass back to Fiona who's gonna offer the opportunity for questions. Thanks very much, Kate. <clears throat> Sorry, and thanks very much, um, Laura. Um, so if anyone has any questions, we've got about five minutes, so um, feel free to put them in the Q&A session. But one question um, for you, Laura, is you mentioned about um, possible prosecution. And if an individual is prosecuted, is it likely to be someone senior within the organisation or who would that tend to be? Yeah, I, I think in most cases it's likely to be, if anyone, it's going to be someone senior in the organisation. Um, under the Health and Safety at Work Act, their, Section 37 allows um, for a, a senior person within the organisation to be prosecuted along with the organisation if it can be shown that the, um, that the breach was committed with their connivance or you know through sort of um ignoring you know closing an eye to, to something that was was going on so um the focus is likely to be on a senior person they could also be a 
prosecuted just as an individual, not under uh, Section 30, 37. Um, so, yes, it, unless somebody, and it, it's difficult in, in, in this particular scenario where we're you know, thinking about damp and mould, it's difficult to see where there would be an obvious route to prosecution of somebody who's in a more junior role. Okay. Thank you. Hopefully that alleviates any concerns that people <laughs> may have. Um, <clears throat> and one question that's come through, um, I think this probably sits best with you, Kate. Um, can someone make a claim where they haven't become ill, but they're just worried or unhappy because of the mould? And if so, what are the time limits that are involved? Yeah, in terms of the Occupiers Liability Act, as I said, there has to be a, an injury. Um, and so uh, for a personal injury claim, just being upset or distressed isn't enough. There needs to be either a physical injury or a, or a diagnosable psychiatric condition. So it wouldn't be possible to make a claim. Although you know, I can understand it would be very distressing. That wouldn't that wouldn't give rise to a claim. If there is an injury, you would have three years from either the point you were injured, or if it's an ongoing thing, the point at which the, the harm stopped being caused to the person. Um, and if you're talking about damage to property, it's five years. Um, to raise a claim. Okay, we've got a couple of other questions that come through. We'll try and um, squeeze in. Um, so one that I think we might be able to answer quite quickly: Would a tenant refusing entry to inspect or repair the property constitute a defence under the Occupiers Liability Act? Possibly. Um, I think because you're looking at what's reasonable in the circumstances. If the landlord had other means to force repairs. Um, on a property or to take access, it could be argued that they should have done that. But I think it would be difficult for the person who refused entry to then say the landlord was in, in breach for not doing that. I think it could be difficult if you had someone refusing entry and someone else becoming ill, so say a child in the property. Um, I think I, th I think you probably would have a good defence there, um, but it would just depend on the particular circumstances and I suppose the nature of the tenancy and the landlord's rights in terms of that. Yeah, and I suppose <clears throat> just to follow up on that, it depends if you're using the model Scottish Secure Tenancy, there are provisions um, contained within there about forcing access to the property um, for repairs and providing um, a period of notice to do that, generally around 24 hours, but there are obvious difficulties around um, tenants who even with providing such notice still refuse um, access to the property and ultimately um, there are um, steps that can be taken in the sheriff court in order to gain a warrant for access. So that's something that I suppose could be considered in order to mitigate any yeah. concerns around um, a breach of the Occupiers Liability Act. Um, and one um, final question is the standard Scottish Secure Tenancy that I just mentioned that requires landlords to maintain the house so the tenant can heat the house to a reasonable temperature and at a reasonable cost. There are obvious um, issues around the recent increase in utility costs at the moment. So what do you think the impact of that would be in terms of any possible claims? In terms of the Occupiers Liability Act, I think that would, I think it's it's difficult because you're back to what's reasonable. So if mm -hmm. there was a reasonable thing a landlord could do to make the, you know, it could be insulated reasonably quickly at a reasonably an affordable cost for the organisation. You know, we're talking about social landlords who will have limited funds. I think I think there could be an argument there that it would have been reasonable for the landlord to make the house easier to heat. I think that might be quite difficult, um, mm. especially given the fact that the re recent prices are hopefully transient um, mm. and, and certainly came about quite suddenly. But I think it's possible you might say that the the need to insulate has been ongoing and so the, the failure to do that's just crystallised now but the the need to do it's been obvious for longer. Okay thank you and I suppose directing tenants to appropriate support organisations that can arrange to get the relevant 
um, grants and fundings and things for the tenants to be able to ensure appropriate heating. Our contact details are on the slides. Um, in addition, if you have any other questions that pop into your mind um, after this session, please don't hesitate to get in touch with um, any of us that we're speaking um, at the seminar today or alternatively your usual Brodie's contact and we'll be more than happy to help you. Um, and I suppose all that's left for me to say is thank you very much for joining us this afternoon on a topic that no doubt we'll be speaking about for quite some time um, and hopefully we will see you all in the very near future. Thank you.